innovation is basically has to do three things. It needs to be something new, which is new to the world. It could be new to a company. It could be new to a country. It needs to bring some value to someone or something somewhere. And it needs to exist in real life. Somebody said, hey, how come adults don't play kickball? And next thing you knew, we had a league formed and uh, had named it the World Adult Kickball Association. We're a fantasy sports and betting company that lets players for the first time bet on their very own fantasy sports league matchups and outcomes. You can sync your fantasy league onto our platform and we'll generate the odds and specific betting categories. I wanted to create something for everyone to remind them that they are not alone. And that's what inspired me. I'm Richard Gerhardt. And I'm Elizabeth Gerhardt. You just heard a few select segments uh, from our guests, so stay tuned and hear the rest of the show. Coming up next. Welcome to Passage to Profit, everybody, the show that talks about entrepreneurism, innovation, and the intellectual property that helps them flourish. Tonight on our show, we're going to be talking uh, with a very special guest who's going to be talking about innovation. Uh, he is the CEO of Innovinco, and he's going to have a lot of interesting insights on the innovative process, which, of course, is uh, so important to entrepreneurism. And uh, right after that, we're going to have uh, Johnny Lehane from the Hudson Valley uh, Startup Fund and talking about money and why it's good and how if you're an investor, you can get some, too. And then we have two presenters. So this is both of them have great products. So Sahil Patel has a new way to bet on your favorite teams. And my son loves this. I told my son about it, my 30 year old, <laughs> soon to be 30 year old son. Uh, so listen up for this. And then uh, Antonio. I mean, he shouldn't be spending money on that stuff. But he loves to. <laughs> they, he shouldn't, but he does. Just like he shouldn't be doing a lot of things you do. Anyway, um, and then we have an Antonia Tomeo who just has this beautiful, beautiful story and a wonderful product for inspiration for everybody. So please stay tuned. Yeah, that sounds great. But before we get to our distinguished guests and fascinating presenters, it's time for IP in the news. So oh boy. what's up first? Well, <laughs> have you ever heard of unicorn meat? <laughs> so I, I, I it's just like canned, a special hors d'oeuvre or something. That canned you, unicorn meat. Uh, so, so uh, Think Geek decided to do an April Fool's joke. So okay. Think Geek is this really wild website that if you're a geek, you can go there and think. And then they have all these products that uh, connect with geeks, right? Right. So. Some of them were on the Big Bang Theory, like they're uh, shower curtain that was a periodic table of the elements anyway they decided to pull this april fool's joke so they were advertising uh canned unicorn meat the new white meat right and it was on april fool so something should be telling you that there's something not quite but right with they, that story they did fool the national pork board which objected to <laughs> They had a trademark on, on the, the other uh, white meat. And so their lawyers immediately <laughs> sent a cease and desist letter. And can you imagine their surprise when they found out there is no such thing as canned, canned unicorn meat. meat? You know, I mean, come on, guys, get your act together. And so, I wonder who paid for that letter. Was it the law firm or was it the pork board after so, they found out what happened? So, look, look. So that came from Natalie Webster on trademarknow.com, that website. And her lesson from this was like, do your research and your due diligence a little bit before you go off and yeah, attack somebody for that, something that doesn't exist. This may exist. shock a lot of people, but you are supposed to make sure that somebody's doing something wrong before you start accusing them of wrongdoing. Anyway. So anyway, so... How we can top that, I don't know, but um, now a local story for New Yorkers. Um, the New York City is suing New York cannabis designer over trademarks. So, of course, New York City makes a lot of money on its trademarks. You, you know, I, I don't know if Cincinnati or, um, or Peoria, uh, Illinois have strong pra pra trademark protection and they enforce it, but the city of New York certainly does because people have heard of New York and it's another way to generate revenue. So they have a lot of trademarks. And so they got into this trademark dispute because uh, Robert uh, Lopez uh, decided that um, the, this one t-shirt was 
uh, uh, violating the city's trademark. And I just think it's interesting that the city has a very active uh, uh, enforcement program for violation of well, trademarks. Well, I think so. that Robert Lopez, who's filed complaints against other people, was the one he used it on for New York City cannabis and he used their trademark and he didn't deny it. He just tried to say that it's it was fair use and parody. And yeah, because he wasn't a lawyer, he didn't think that he should be charged with tra trademark infringement. But the, that the judge disagreed. So anyway. so anyway, the moral of the story is if you live in New York, be careful how you use the term New York. <laughs> well, and their pictures and everything in their letter. I mean, they make a lot of money from tourists off of that. So, yeah, right. I mean, I, you know, they not? license it to all these other companies that make products. So, yeah, I, anyway. I want to know if Tacoma has a trademark on their name. I don't know, because there was a truck called Tacoma. So I don't know. Maybe, Maybe not. Well, anyway, it's time for Richard's Roundtable and time to get serious and talk about intellectual property matters. Um, I was just going to go around and ask uh, our guests any comments they have on these stories, or if you have any questions about intellectual property in general, uh, we'll do our best to answer them. So Tom, uh, welcome to the show. And uh, thank you. is there any possible way you can respond to what you just heard? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's just one of sheer disappointment that I won't be able to taste New York unicorn meat. <laughs> I, was, I, was, I was really looking forward to that. <laughs> I wonder if it tastes like spam. <laughs> you know, it tastes like chicken, probably. Yeah, you know? <laughs> it tastes like chicken. <laughs> that's that, a good one. That's, that's great. So, uh, Johnny, what do you think? I mean. Uh, well, I wonder if the National Pork Board ever went after Mike Myers for the other, other white meat. Slow oh, for the other, other white meat. If you remember that, except I don't think Tom was looking forward to that because it was baby. This was from an old Mike Myers skit. Really? Uh, somebody else can probably mention the movie. But, oh. uh, but that probably truly was parody. So would that mean you could get away with it because it was truly parody? Well, definitely you can, parody. You can yeah. get parody for, for copyrights, <laughs> but um, it depends on what the goods are. So if you're using it for entertainment purposes, they may not have that cover they well i would think they would though because they use it in advertising so i guess they figured it wasn't worth it for some reason so that, that and i'm surprised new york city got a trademark on that very generic logo anyway if it's the one i think it is and what yeah. i just did in my quick search it's block letters nyc i mean <laughs> it's fake. right right i mean that's pretty you know that's pretty generic. I mean, it kind of means technically that nobody can use the word New York, even if you live in New York, right? So well, you, you send a piece of mail, right? And you put New York City on it. And it means you can't use it for the classifications. They filed the trademark and not for anything. It's the image, right? It is the image, but it's it's probably some font that came in like Windows 95 or something. <laughs> <laughs> Windows 95. Was yeah. that the one that was truly horrible? I can't remember which one. No, Windows ME was the real one. Oh, that, that was that, the that, one. That, that was the worst. Yeah, yeah for sure. Yeah. So, Antonia, what do you have to say about this whole mess? Well, uh, I, it's kind of inspired me to have my seven year old eat meat. I think I'm going to make a meatloaf made out of a unicorn tonight so that I'm going to actually eat it. Uh, you know, but. Uh, <laughs> Like, oh, unicorn, yay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I you know, I think that's that's hilarious. Um uh it's kind of like a Freudian slip. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, you know, if 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 you're pitching to a venture fund or something. Uh, and you serve them unicorn meat, right? right? That's like a good sign because they're all looking for the unicorns, right? Right, so. exactly. So, Hill, come on, what, what do you got to say? Yeah, I'm really curious on the New York City story, just thinking about all the different shops that are in New York City that have the logo, the I Love New York t-shirts, like, I'm wondering if all these companies had to deal with these kind of trademarks or licensing and all that. Yeah, I mean, it's like they can sue everybody in the whole friggin' city, right? I mean, nobody, nobody can, you know, 
use this without fear. So um, I don't well, know. I'm sure they have to all get a license, but I can't imagine the licenses are super expensive because they must have like a thousand licenses out there, right? Yeah, then nothing is expensive in New York. So. <laughs> Kenya, what do you have to say? Because when you mentioned unicorn meat, I didn't think of white meat. I thought of like maybe rainbow colored meat. <laughs> <laughs> so that was kind of weird. But um, <laughs> back to the uh, the trademark issue with New York. I just had a question about fair use. Like what constitutes fair use and how can, I guess, someone either protect themselves on the usage side and then on the uh, infringement side if that happens? Well, um, so really fair use applies to copyrights and not to trademarks. Fair use is not really a defense uh, in trademark um, stuff. Uh, copyright fair use is if you're using it for educational purposes or, uh, or, or parody, if you're, not, if you're using it for uh, not making money, right? So if you're not using it to generate income, uh, if you're citing it as part of a scholarly work, then all of those are, are fair use defenses and they're, they're pretty um, fact specific. So if you were putting a logo on a t-shirt, um, you know, the city might have a, a trademark that covers that. But they all may, also may have you know, copyright protection on it too. You can have, you can have both. So um, really you, your best, the best thing you can do is just pray. <laughs> and hope that you don't get you don't even get caught in the New York logo ripoff uh, ring. So yeah. you got to be careful. You know, we actually, we ran into this in kickball, kickball leagues, logos on shirts, exactly that. And we were in seventy cities around the U.S. So other people would use our logo to attract players as a credible league or whatever, and that we could defend against. But then they'd use our rules, which were copywritten. Yeah, but that we couldn't defend against, and we decided eventually to go with a, an open use policy, but a fair use and a, a accrediting, uh, you know, credit yeah. on, on all use. Yeah. yeah, I mean, yeah, there's certain things you can protect, and then you know, other things you can't. And um, but I mean, that's a you know, that's that's always a challenge when you're building a business is you've got something good and something that could be. Uh, easily replicated you have to you have to account for that you know and and uh, make the business decision that you made like some sort of business decision and maybe it's better for you to get the publicity by having all these other people use it than just you know yeah after all imitation is the sincerest form of flattery true so um so uh that tom, that was just, that was really good and so we're on to tom and tom i i really am interested in your subject because I love innovation. I think all of us here on Passage to Profit love innovation. It's what makes, part of what makes the world an interesting place to live in. Um, and I, I'm just kind of curious, what is innovation? Maybe you could define it for our audience. Yeah, of course. I mean, in its very simplest sense, I think innovation is basically has to do three things. It needs to be something new, which is new to the world. It could be new to a company. It could be new to a country. It needs to bring some value to someone or something somewhere, and it needs to exist in real life. You know, there's a big difference, I think, between ideas which rest in people's heads or rest in papers in people's drawers and real innovation projects, which obviously are out in the world, uh, either making money or adding value to someone somewhere. So I guess those three words, so new, value, and real. Right. And I agree with you. I mean, innovation is great, but like I could dream up like the Star Trek. Um, what was the device where you could transmit your body to some other place? The but transporter. The transfer. That was that's kind of innovative, but I don't think that's ever going to happen. <laughs> Maybe. Well, I'm not going to be the first one <laughs> yeah. that tries it. I'll tell you. <laughs> but what's interesting about? I mean, a lot of people say they're about innovation. What's interesting is that you're working with corporations, and I didn't think corporations were investing that much in innovation. <laughs> And they used to a long time ago, but have they moved back to investing in innovation now? So I, I think what's happening is, so as you said, we work, we work a lot with uh, some of the world's biggest sort of corporations, and they've always tried to uh, deliver new products, new services, new businesses. Um, and I'm not sure where that's kind of swinging to, but they're continuing to do that. And they're 
doing it as best as they can with all the challenges that there are in trying to exist uh, and innovate in these big uh, multinational corporations. So, uh, yeah, they're trying their hardest. They're doing a good job, mostly. Well, I mean, innovating in a big corporation is kind of difficult because you have to, in order to make it work in the markets that they work in, you have to put a lot on the on the line and you have to make some pretty good guesses. And so their innovation tends to be more careful, right? They want to make sure that whatever they're going to invest millions of dollars in is got a reasonable chance of success, right? And absolutely. And, and especially when they've got big brands, uh, you know, that they need to protect the reputation of, you know, especially with your background in intellectual property, you'll know that the value of a brand is, is clearly massive. And so, you know, taking any risk on the integrity or the strength of that brand is not something they would do lightly. So uh, absolutely. Right. So we've, there's been a new class generated, a new term generated a few years ago called intrapreneur, right? So mm. are you, you you're familiar with that right so yeah yeah are you encouraging people in these corporations to be <laughs> entrepreneurs is that part of what you're doing i have to say i'm not a massive fan of the term if i'm really honest <laughs> um because it's kind of a, a sort of a bit of a fake hybrid between entrepreneur and inside a company. And I think they're very different things. You know, some of the principles and methodologies can be the same, but at the end of the day, uh, the way that an entrepreneur can make money and create value is very different in the end from how a large company can do it. The context is different. Uh, the way in which they pull it all together and make it happen is different. So I kind of try and keep those terms apart if, if I can. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. So, well said. So, yeah. So, what do you actually <laughs> do with the companies when you go in there to help people be more innovative? Yeah. So, for the first uh, four years, the company's existed for four years now. And uh, for that first four years, it was really about understanding what the big challenges were. Uh, because in fact, my life before that, um, just going to go back on the backstory. So I spent 18 years actually working in big companies, big corporates, uh, you know, managing big brands, doing innovation projects and things. And um, I, I left there actually because I realized there was such a great opportunity to help these companies to do it better. Uh, so that's when I originally set up, set up the company. And so what we're doing now is really to try and bring the best help that we possibly can for people who were in my shoes four years ago. So what it is, it's often about short, sharp, interventions that deliver results in really short spaces of time. So whereas a lot of our competitors who are the big consultancies are doing projects three, four months, five months, six months, we break it down into little chunks and we sell little bits of help that move it forward from A to B and then come out and then go in for the next chunk. And we're doing that a lot more now through digital. So that's really where the company's going to make sure that the impact we can have is, is global and scalable uh, as we move into the next four to five year horizon. So what are the top three innovation factors uh, to master? I mean, if you're on, on oh, yeah. <laughs> your, uh, and really, I want to be more invasive. Everybody does. Um, and so what, what, what do we need to do to get there? Okay. Uh, number one, which should be the easiest one, but it's so tough, is actually to spend time and listen to your customers or your potential customers. Because what happens in the innovation world and also in the entrepreneurship world is people get really obsessed with an idea, with a solution. And they can spend a lot of time and money developing it whilst forgetting that the only reason that someone would actually buy that is if it solves their problem <laughs> or it brings them some kind of joy or value or emotion or what have you. So definitely tip number one would be uh, spend time with, understand, go as deep as you can with people that you're trying to, to attract and you're trying to serve. So that would definitely be number one. Number two, Hmm. Number two would probably be to 
create as lots of different solutions rather than just getting obsessed about one of them. So really trying to find lots of different ways in which you can solve the problem uh, in order that you don't get really kind of blinkered on just one solution in case that doesn't work because quite often one solution won't work. And so uh, hedge your bets, if you like, by looking at multiple solutions in parallel. And then number three would be definitely adopt a sort of test and learn mindset. So, you know, the startup community is pretty good at this, you know, getting out there with rough early prototypes, models, landing pages, all of that kind of stuff to be able to test whether or not it's doing something right. Uh, but in the corporate side, it's it's not quite embedded yet in the way that they're, they're working. So definitely everything about quick test and learn in order to optimize what it is that you're working on. Those would be my three. And, and, and what would be some of the mistakes that people make when it comes to innovation? Oh, wow. Uh, Probably the opposite of what I've just said. <laughs> <laughs> really? so, that was an innovative answer. <laughs> so like identifying, identifying an idea and zeroing in on it and shutting out the rest of the world, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think, I think a lot of sort of when people start making a lot of decisions themselves about an idea, uh, that's when you kind of sends red warning signs. If they're deciding, well, I like it like this, or I think it should be like this, that sends big warning signs. You think, go and speak to your customer, get their opinion, because they're the only ones at the end that count. So this is hard in corporations because there's a lot of rivalry among people. So what do, what do you do with the not, in my, not invented in my backyard, so I'm not going to take a look at this what do you do with that? Well, I think that the mo it's most basic level, what we do and what we need to do is to get people talking and collaborating across different teams, you know, breaking down silos, trying to get people who, you know, you can never launch an innovation project with one person or one function. And so what you really need to do is to pull together this diverse group of people and capitalize on the strengths of all of them uh, rather than it just be one team or one department. So quite a lot of the job that we need to do is to, to bring those people together and get them talking the same language and also get them pointing in the same direction. <laughs> because if that doesn't happen, it's highly unlikely that the project will actually happen and it'll work. So, Well, I do have to say Kenya is works in a corporation and she is incredibly innovative and creative. So Kenya, do you have any comments or questions? Thank you for that, Elizabeth. I, I guess, how do you avoid like innovation burnout, right? Because I feel like sometimes when you come with like a spirit of creativity, it's it's exhausting sometimes, especially when you're working for a large corporation. And I'm assuming that it helps to have a team around you that kind of lifts the load. Yeah, so absolutely. And it's, from my perspective, it's actually quite a serious problem that doesn't get talked about that much. But, you know, being uh, an innovator in a large company is super tough. It's probably one of the hardest jobs within a corporation because every single day you're trying to change stuff. You're trying to change the way that things are done. You're trying to change the products that the company sells. You're trying to change the way in which the company works together. And so you're pushing all the time against sometimes a, a sort of a megalith that's been there for, for hundreds of years. And it is super tiring. I, I definitely agree, agree with you on that, Kenya. So I think having a team around you is definitely um definitely a key success factor. I think the second thing is, one thing I found personally really useful when I was on the client side was to have a coach, actually, someone who's external to the company, who has some of that expertise, who has been in that position, who can just give you a, a sense of perspective and guide you a little bit in how to navigate some of those more tricky situations. Um, and that's what I had when, when I was in that position and it really helped me. So I think a team definitely to share the load and then someone externally who can coach you, who can mentor you, who can support you as you make your way through those projects. Wow, that's uh, um, uh, amazing advice. And I, I it, it sounds like good advice because lots of times you don't know what you don't know. 
right? And so <laughs> having somebody who knows what you don't know and then tell you what you don't know, so then you know it, is pretty helpful, right? Can you say that? Absolutely. Real fast? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think coaches are kind of your advocate too, right? So, yeah, if, if some if somebody's pushing against what you're trying to do, your coach can help you push back, right? And also to keep a sense of perspective, because it's quite easy, whether on the entrepreneur side or on the corporate side, and I, I've known both of them, to get pretty obsessed with what it is that you're doing. <laughs> you know, it becomes your life, really, yeah. uh, even if you've got a great personal life and a great family life, uh, as I have as well. But you sometimes get a bit too obsessed with making it work. And I think having someone who can sort of pull you outside of that and uh, really help you to realize that maybe it's not quite as important as you think and the problem isn't quite as difficult to solve as you think is a, is a really nice thing to have. So Tom, do you think that every single person has it in them to be innovative? Absolutely, without exception. So it's simply because, uh, and I think this is a really quite often misunderstood, you know, people often think they're sort of creative or they're not creative. And there, you know, it's a little bit true, you know, I think everyone can be creative, but there are probably some people who are more naturally creative than others. But innovation is quite different in the fact that, you know, creativity is just one small part of it. And the rest of it is really process. I, I hate to kill the myth, but, you know, at the end of the day, it's not really about visionary people who are uh, necessarily want to change the world with billions of dollars you know this stuff is a bit like a sausage machine if you put great inputs in and you follow great process you get great stuff out and and so you don't have to be some kind of genius or exceptional person to be able to run that process if you master it really well so yeah i do think that everyone can contribute to and also lead innovation in an effective way I've always thought that entrepreneurism is innovation executing on creativity, Ooh. right? So that you really, when you're, when you're in the entrepreneurial space, you have to be uh, creative, you have to be innovative. Um, you also have courage. So it could also be courage executing on creativity. Um, and those are all of the kind of the, the basic pieces of, of uh, the innovation uh, and the uh, 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 entrepreneurial mindset, but it's the execution piece, right? Mm -hmm. That you're talking about when you're talking about process. So how, okay. how, do you, how do you unpack that and get to a point where the execution piece starts happening? To be honest, I think you're, you're absolutely right. You know, the execution piece is the absolute hardest part of this whole thing, S simply because it's, you know, let's be honest, it's quite easy to have ideas and it's quite easy actually to have good ideas. But the key difference between either the entrepreneurs or the companies who are really high performing uh, on kind of innovation and business performance are the ones that take action. They're the ones that say, we're going to do it. We're going to launch it. We're going to take that risk. We're going to invest in it. And okay, it may not work every time, but at least we'll learn something and we won't have any regrets that we, we didn't do it. So I think in terms of how to do it, you know, one of the key things is really about just making sure you're clear on who you expect to buy your product or service and who are the very first people, who are those early users who you can test with, you can learn from, they can become your advocates and therefore you can tweak and optimize little things before you put it to more of a, a mass general market. And I think if you identify those people really well, it can really help you in terms of the strong execution afterwards. Right. And do you feel you're talking about developing these, whatever the project is, do you feel that innovation spurs innovation? Because sometimes it feels that way, right? Absolutely. And it, it plays a massive part in culture, whether it's a, a culture of a startup or culture in a big company. You know, as soon as you get people behaving 
in an innovative way. And definitely as soon as people start seeing results, like tangible results from innovation projects, it just breeds this culture, which really helps to support that and really helps that to grow uh, within that startup or that organization. So I absolutely 100% agree with you. That's great. Well, we've come to the end of the segment. I just want to say thanks, Tom. Uh, this has been a fascinating pleasure. discussion, <laughs> and I hope you'll stay with us for the rest of the show. Of course. And My pleasure. Uh, we'll be back right after this. You're listening to Passage to Profit on WOR 710, the voice of trademark New York. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. Welcome back. It's still Passage to Profit with Richard and Elizabeth Gerhardt. And we have with us uh, Johnny Lahane, who is not a rock star, but he is in his own way. Um, <laughs> and he is a uh, manager of Hudson Valley Startup Fund. And welcome to the show, Johnny. Great to have you. Oh, thanks a lot. A pleasure to be here. And uh, really impressed by Tom's story. And actually, I hope we get to talk about the other hat that I wear, which is as head of research and development at Hudson Valley Center for Innovation. So, oh. Tom, I think we could write a book together, honestly. You're on the inside, <laughs> I'm on the outside, trying to fill the gap for my startup fund hat, but a ton to dig into there. So hopefully we can draw you back into my conversation, uh, our conversation as well. That's really great. So what is a startup fund? Great, uh, thanks for asking. So it's bringing angel investors together. I noticed here in the Hudson Valley between New York City and Albany, uh, that there wasn't what we think of as organized capital. Lots of folks had the wherewithal to invest in public markets. Some folks were creating their own small businesses, uh, but folks who were looking for a moonshot for a unicorn or even for a company that might be 10 or 50 million in revenue need early capital. They need angel investment. And there were one-offs here and there. We, uh, I know you guys have had Sandy on the show and he was just looking at this the same time we were uh, a little north of him. So he was in Westchester, we were in Poughkeepsie and Kingston. Uh, but we ended up bringing together 40 accredited investors. I don't know if you guys have uh, discussed that term on the show before. But no, could you, uh, that would be a great explanation, so. Absolutely, so that's folks who, according to the SEC, have the wherewithal to invest at this level of risk taking because there's no guarantee of return. Um, so that's either 200, thousand dollars a year in annual salary or over a million dollars uh, in savings besides your house. Um, and then the basic recommendations are not more than a million dollars of your net worth should be invested at this risky level, basically. Um, but we look at really early stage businesses that will have a chasm to cross before they are profitable, but the profit opportunity is so big that you're willing to invest in this. And usually you invest uh, with a form of debt uh, called convertible debt, um, or with direct ownership in equity. And you're hoping these companies go on to get professional money, venture capital uh, in subsequent rounds as they innovate. So let me ask you, what, what's a convertible note and what's equity? Great, great question. Uh, so a convertible note is like a loan that you're not collecting the interest on, but it is accruing interest. Um, but then there's a trigger in it uh, that in the future, when other people invest in the business, when other investors come in, uh, the value of that initial investment will be determined at that time. And it will convert into equity or shares in the company. Got so it. it will become shares in the company at a later date when somebody else pins down the value. But we're not ready to do that. It's too early stage. If things uh, go another direction, it might stay debt and we might collect the loan plus interest. That's not the road we want to take, but that vehicle is built into the legal document. So you don't lose your shirt on everything. You might lose your shirt on it. If there's, it, it allows you to be in line with the debt holders, which are in front of the equity holders, as you know. Um, but if there's nothing there, then there's nothing for anybody, even the debt holders, which can happen, right. especially in a software startup. So if a, soft, yeah. if a, a startup fails, there's just no m way to collect on the note and everybody just cries their eyes right. out over a beer and calls it a day. And that actually gave birth to uh, an even simpler vehicle called a safe note uh, that sort of feels like convertible debt, except you can't convert the debt on it. But it puts off or punts that decision on the value until a later round of investment right. in a so, similar way. Yeah. So I want to bring this down just a little bit. <laughs> this is, yeah, this this is very, kind of high level I'm, stuff. I'm already confused. <laughs> 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 yeah, <so first>. <laughs> but um, but 
if I were, well, I do have my own startup, but I'm still doing law, law firm money, no, not a personal funds for it. Um, I'm using my own personal funds for it. But if I were to go to your fund and say, okay, I have the startup, would you take a look at me and see if you would give me money to run this startup? What's the process that people go through for that? Great question. Um, so first it's our, it's our criteria, right? What kind of companies are we going to look at? So the initial conversation is, are you looking at a company that's likely to be able to get to 10 or $50 million a year in the next five or 10 years? Hopefully much more than that, but revenue. Um, so if that's not what you're building, then we're not the starting point for you. So we try to get that conversation out of the way. Then we look at what stage you're at. You have to have built something. We need a prototype. I know you've heard this before from other guests on your show, uh, but really we want to see some traction in the market. If you're B2B business to business, that means some pilots with paying business customers. If you're business to consumer, think of social media. Uh, which you're probably not going to be the next Facebook, by the way. Let me just get that out, out there right away. We've had dozens of folks come to us believing they are going to be. Um, but if you're B2C, then lots of users um, and an understanding of where a business model is going to be, where that revenue path is going to be. But you don't necessarily need to have that revenue yet. So that's something that your first point is something that Richard has said quite often. He sits on the Westchester Angels in their group, but yep. it has to be scalable, right? So you can't, to get investment funding, especially in tech, you can't just be selling to one or two people from the corner store. I would say if you're going the classic venture capital route, that is true. Uh, we look hard, especially here in the Hudson Valley for alternative routes for great software that maybe isn't gonna be the next Facebook or the next Google but should exist and does have a viable audience and shouldn't have to be built off of your home uh, equity line or an SBA loan that's probably tied to your home as well. Interesting. Is it just tech that you fund or do you look at we, others? We're agnostic. So the Hudson Valley Startup Fund is focused on investment in companies in the Hudson Valley or with a strong tie to the Hudson Valley. We see that as everything for fund one, it was everything between New York City and Albany exclusive, so not Albany area, not New York City. Eastern New York Angels is an established fund uh, up in the Albany Troy area, and we worked with them, and they were actually a mentor for us. And New York City's got lots of capital, lots of organized angel investment fund. We weren't going to move the needle a lot in that area. We really wanted to impact the Hudson Valley. Um, so that was the first fund. The second fund, we realized that a relationship with New York City was important. So we actually opened small bets, $50,000 range investments to companies um, in New York City that might have a viable path to do uh, to having a greater presence in the Hudson Valley. And in our next fund, Fund 3, which we're actually looking at going somewhere between um, an angel investment fund and a venture fund, about a $10 million fund, we will at the very uh, earliest stages, post accelerator, um, invest in companies that might not have a presence in the Hudson Valley at this time. Wow. Uh, so that's, uh, that's a pretty active uh, business for you, and it is extremely uh, sophisticated for sure. Uh, how did you get your start in business, and how did you get to the point where you're doing all this fancy finance? It's very strange trip. I actually am an electrical engineer by training, so I thought I was going to go off and follow my father's footsteps of an IBM -er for 36 years uh, and do something in that. Um, I ended up at America Online for eight years and did software and understood uh, deep tech pretty well there. But I also accidentally started an adult kickball league. What? <laughs> <laughs> wait, 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 wait. There are, are there are adults who like to play kickball. But you, you, you didn't do a Squid Games thing, I hope. <laughs> no, oh no my God, games. don't even no say that games. word. <laughs> um, so yeah, uh, with a couple friends at a, a very popular bar, shout out to Kelly's Irish Times actually, where my entrepreneurship journey really started. Uh, and somebody said, hey, how come adults don't play kickball? And next thing you knew, we had a league formed and uh, had named it the World Adult Kickball Association. So had grand plans even while we continued our day jobs. Uh, but in the dot bomb in 2001, for those who remember that, uh, one of my buddies who was also running these kickball leagues with me lost his job and spent half his time looking for a job and half his time growing the kickball leagues. And uh, we had people calling us from Florida and Boston who had played in our DC leagues who said, I want it here. That's, those were the most fun times to look forward to each week. 
Um, so it was before you could just stand up a Google workspace and launch a remote distributed business, no Zoom. Uh, but we had enough tech uh, savvy to build our own infrastructure, our own payment system, our own league management systems, and grew to uh, 70 cities across the US and launched wow. a franchising arm. Uh, and that was all bootstrap. So to bring it back a little bit to the context of startup fund, bootstrap means we funded it ourselves. We got traditional bank loans, uh, the journey of a lot of small businesses, mm -hmm. uh, but we were distributed in terms of, we didn't have a home, we didn't have an office. We never rented a physical office. We wow. only rented kickball fields and then softball fields and soccer fields and flag football fields. So what is the profile of the adult kickball player? <laughs> yeah, 21 to 35, it's very social. Um, and then it ranges from looking for an excuse to be out on a weeknight to looking to relive their D1 glory, um, except in this <laughs> new sport of kickball. Um, and I mentioned before so is, the show. Is kickball like soccer? <laughs> no. It's a it's between baseball and soccer. You bowl the ball, the big red rubber ball from the home, <laughs> from the pitching mound, you kick it, and then you run the bases and you can throw the ball at the runner. Ah, is it, and is there a professional league ball. for this, right? Tom, there's is, no is, professional league anywhere. Nobody <laughs> lettered in, in high school. Um, so it's ridiculous. So I always say, like, I got my business knowledge in a ridiculous, probably the most ridiculous way you could. <laughs> but I had to learn a lot of challenges when we had a full-time staff of 50, 250 people running leagues and businesses on the ground. Um, and we're throwing events where we had thousands of people show up for four days in a city, uh, sometimes overwhelming their local bar scene. Yeah. <laughs> Nice. Well, I bet when you kicked off your league, you were oh. especially. Kenya, do you have any? Do you have any? Yeah. Please rescue us. <laughs> Please rescue us. A couple, couple little fun facts about me. I hated kickball in school. I never understood the concept of someone kicking a ball at your head and then and run Better around. Better than dodgeball, though, right? <laughs> <laughs> this is so true. And and I, I appreciate what you're doing because I live in the Hudson Valley. I live in Orange County. So oh, shout great. out to Orange County. Yeah, so yeah. I just I had I'm curious to know, like outside of the prototype and the pitches that you get and how do you know, like somebody has something really good that's worth, you know, taking a shot at? Great question. Thanks for uh, bringing it back uh, to uh, the passage to profit. So for us, there are several elements. And again, I've heard other guests uh, share some of these similar things on, uh, on the show before. But one of the thing is if it's just someone, an, an individual, that's gonna be hard. We like to see a really strong team and a team that knows their gaps, like has identified, well, we actually have te tech chops and can write this ourselves. And we have some business uh, management and operations experience. We don't have a marketing person. So in our first raise or our next raise, we are actually outsourcing marketing, but we're looking for strategic investors that come from the marketing world that's appropriate for us. So now know thyself, right? So a team that's really self-aware is a good one. Um, and then, and this ties back to Tom, one of the things that I would have added to Tom for how to innovate is looking at the landscape, looking at the historical landscape of the business and the opportunity they're jumping in and looking at it today. Who are your hundreds nearest competitors is what I'll ask people. And they'll say, we have, nobody's doing this. And I'll swear at them um, because somebody's solving a part of this problem for the people in your world. Uh, Tom said, first and foremost, to listen to your customer. We call it at the Hudson Valley Center for Innovation, another hat I wear, smashing into the market. You need to be all over the place and really listen, like Tom said, and know their pain points and know what they don't know because, uh, you know, Richard said that earlier, we got to know what they don't know, because we've seen a broad uh, swath of industries, so we can tie the, the threads together. Yeah, so Tom, that's an opening for you. Do you have a comment or question? Yeah, I think um, I, I completely agree with what Johnny just said. In fact, if no one is doing anything like about that, it means that the probably means that the need isn't there. Uh, and so they might be doing it in a different way. They might be doing it with a different product or a different service, or they might be doing it themselves, whatever it is. But if there's literally someone comes in and says, no one is doing this and whatever, it sends big red warning signs to me because it gives a risk that actually the market for whatever you're working on doesn't exist. Interesting. I mean, I've heard business people talk about that issue in the past. And sometimes they say, well, we'll create the need. 
And I guess if you're a really big company, you can try to pull that off, but you're shaking your head there. So I'm assuming you don't completely <laughs> disagree. And you have tools to gauge that need anyway. Jobs to yeah. be done is a great framework. Absolutely. If you Googled it. Um, you can talk to the client base. And I talk about those impacting and those impacted by whatever space you're in. You can talk to those people and you'll find out if it's a pain point or not or a delight yeah. point. Something but is they it really didn't know they would need in the world? Right? Is it marketing all about creating the need? <laughs> I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna invest in a company that needs marketing. I want a flywheel. I want a thing that goes viral, and I have to keep up on that fun curve. Uh, now we need to get on before they hit the fun curve, and that's our challenge. Is we need to see a team that can do it, and we can see that that wave is coming, and that comes with the experience of lots of seeing lots of businesses. That's a fascinating point. I mean, finding those those virallers are that's that's the key, isn't it? And then the team that can execute around it and keep up and not implode for sure. So, do you guys run your own pitch competitions at all? I mean, it's I think that's something an entrepreneur needs to do is go watch some pitches. Absolutely, great question. So, um, the startup fund, our member meetings are monthly. Uh, pitches, and those are generally closed. We have guests come to those. But with the Hudson Valley Center for Innovation, again, the other hat, we run accelerator programs and we also foster or support innovation programs, uh, both standalones and with universities uh, and municipalities. So there are opportunities there. I would also recommend upstate capital, uh, both in the city and north. Uh, they have a lot of events. And there's always a pinch element, Adam. And I'm actually on SUNY New Paltz's campus today. Uh, SUNY New Paltz has the Venture Hub, and today is Venture Fest. And we have six companies that are doing three-minute lightning pitches. I feel so bad for them. You can't get anything really across <laughs> in three minutes, except that you know what you're talking about and that you're the right person to maybe tackle this problem. Um, and we've also had Hudson Valley... Uh, Tech Startup Weekend. So Techstars throws these things around the country called Startup Weekends. And uh, the Startup Fund, the Center for Innovation and other Hudson Valley organizations partnered with them. And that drew some folks, some innovators out of the woodwork who had some really interesting experience. And we've seen a new demographic up here in the Hudson Valley. Uh, I don't know if you read the stories, Ulster County fastest growing real estate prices in the nation because of post pandemic migrations. Uh, so we've seen a lot of talent come up from New York City and want to do different things, sometimes solving a social problem uh, that they've, that's really come to light recently. So it's an exciting time for us to be investing in local innovation. Awesome. Well, Johnny, this has been fascinating. You've been a great guest, and uh, I just love the kickball angle. <laughs> um, and, but I mean, seriously, it, you, you deserve a lot of credit for taking something like that and making it what it was. I mean, that any kind growing, any kind of business is, is tough. And I wouldn't have started with kickball myself, but you made it work. So kudos to you. We have to take a break. We'll be back with more passage to private right after this. Well, we're still here. You're listening to Passage to Profit with Richard and Elizabeth Gerhardt. And, and now it's time for Power Move. Kenya Gibson is with us. She's our media maven from iHeart. Kenya, tell us about Power Move this week. Well, thank you for having me on, Richard and Elizabeth. And for Power Move this week, we're going to be talking about Rick Ross. So Rick Ross is, according to Forbes, one of hip hop's cash kings. So he recently opened up 24 wing stops across the South. And he also, in addition, lost 80 pounds on his health <laughs> journey and decided to pivot his way into the healthcare industry by making a $1 million investment into a telehealth company called JetDoc. It's a virtual urgent care mobile app. It's a startup that he's decided to you know, venture into because of his wellness journey and his health and his interest in that space. And is making it happen. So that's today's power move. Wow. Awesome. Did he lose 80 pounds eating chicken wings then? <laughs> no. The chicken he, wing diet. Yeah. yeah, no, he actually, he didn't. Uh, he lost 80 pounds because he had two seizures. One of them, yeah. which he was away, he was able to walk away from. And then another one that left him hospitalized for a while. So he decided to 
get his health in check um, and became very interested in health and wellness, which is why, you know, he wants to make sure that people have access to adequate health care. But yeah, I wonder if there is a chicken wing diet of some sort. There is protein in chicken, though. So I don't know. <laughs> right. The it's the part that kills lose. you, though. I mean, well, I just, yeah, for sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, well, good for him. And, and what, what, what's the name? It, it's what's the name of the startup again? It's called Jet Doc. Jet Doc. So yeah. before the store show, I'm going to just reveal a little bit here. We thought that the name of the startup was Jet Doe. And we were trying to figure out how that had anything to do with health. Um, <laughs> and it's like you get your dough super fast. Right. And, that, and that way you're healthier. But we found out later that it's Jet it Doc. And, I, I, I saw the perplexity. Down. I saw the perplexity in your faces. You're like, wait a minute. What is that? <laughs> <laughs> so I, I got it together and decided to that I would reference Forbes because they're pretty accurate. So, yeah, thanks for the. Yeah. Well, yeah. That, that's uh, <laughs> that's uh, that's great information, Kenya. Thanks a lot. And what do you say? It's time for some fireside. Sure. So my startup is Fireside Directory. It's a video directory of small businesses. And we just recently filed a patent application with both our names on it. So there's... I sort of horned my way into it. <laughs> <laughs> but it has... It has some extra goodies in there marketing wise for people that do videos for it. Um, I don't, the patent won't be published for another year and a half. So I don't want to give away the secrets just yet. But Under the advice of her attorney. <laughs> yes, my patent. <laughs> well, I drafted the patent because I'm a patent agent, but your law did file it. And we've also filed a trademark on Fireside. So now I, I had been doing interviews of people all through COVID quarantine. Now I'm really working on the website with a website person. And it was hard to find the right person because I really just needed the back end. I didn't really need the front end because I know how to design it, but I found, I think I found the right guy. So we're going to start moving forward and try to get this thing. To, yeah. He's a to wonderful a man. Well, the way you talk about him all the time, it's like, oh, he says this and he says that. So, I mean, he has to be wonderful to impress you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I don't know where any of this is coming from. <laughs> anyway, anyway, no, but but he's he did a video with me for the site and I explained and he really understands what I'm trying to do. So that I think that's you know, he, I'm his customer. Like you guys were just saying, listen to the people that you're going to do the work for and see what they really want. And a lot of people were approaching this. I talked to a lot of website people were approaching this from, Oh, the branding part. It's like, no, this is not that kind of website. It's a directory. So um, anyways, he gets it and we're going to start working on, I, I do have a website now, but I, I don't really, it doesn't reflect what I need it to be at the end. So yeah. So we're, we're redoing it. So we're excited about that. Yeah. And um, so it's time for a break. And we'll, we'll be right back <laughs> after this Passage to Profit commercial moment. Welcome back, listeners, to Passage to Profit on WOR 710, the voice of New York, with Richard and Elizabeth Gearhart. We are now on to our presenter, Sahil Patel, who has this incredible app program that the millennials love and anybody who likes sports loves and i'm not gonna say anything more about it i'm gonna let him tell you what it is welcome yeah thanks elizabeth and richard pleasure to be here so sahil uh, co-founder and ceo of better fantasy we're a fantasy sports and betting company that lets players for the first time bet on their very own fantasy sports league matchups and outcomes now what this means is that you can sync your fantasy league onto our platform and we'll generate the odds and specific betting categories that you and the rest of your league can bet on. So my league has been placing side bets for years now. Myself and my co-founders have all been in the same fantasy league for about 15 years. And there's always week to week offline wagers taking place. We've had a spreadsheet that tracked odds across different matchups. And I frequently texted uh, other people in the league like, hey, I think I'm going to beat your team. We should put money on this. And we just figure there's an opportunity to take this offline behavior and bring it onto a fully digital platform. So to fast forward to this week, one of the NFL season, we've launched Better Fantasy to the Apple and Google app stores in early September. And we've seen great engagement from our, from our uh, user base so far. 
This first season is entirely free to play where users get in-game currency that they can use to bet on their matchups. We also have daily, weekly, season-long challenges that let users refuel their in-game currency so they can enjoy the platform every day of the week. And to incentivize users on the platform for this first season, we're offering prizes like gift cards that users can exchange their currency for, but they can also make donations to our charity partners right on the platform. And as I mentioned, we're starting off as free to play with the NFL season with football, but our goal is to enable real money betting next year, as well as expand into all different kinds of sports and even esports in order to bring our platform to the masses. That's great. Are you going to expand the kickball? <laughs> yeah, we might have to. <laughs> well, this is funny because our son did an offline betting thing just like this, exactly what you're talking about with his friends. And he won the league and his friend had spent half the money. <laughs> so he never got all the money from it. <laughs> so. Right. So now we have safeguards, right? Yes. You know, you have safeguards from your crooked friends. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Yeah, but but he really I, I told him about this and he was very interested in it. So he's almost 30. He'll be 30 this month, actually. We're taping in October. And um I haven't done a lot of fantasy betting myself, but I know it's huge. Like yeah. So what kind of traction has your app gotten so far? Is it still in beta or is it really out there and available? Yeah. So we have close to 400 users who've downloaded the app and we haven't even done any marketing yet uh, because we want to get our early users on the platform, get their feedback like Tom and Johnny have mentioned and really iterate the product before we scale out to the masses. So around 400 users have downloaded the app and they've placed more than 3000 bets already uh, within the five weeks of the NFL season. So Exactly to, to Tom and Johnny's point, we try and set up these iteration and feedback loops so that we can hear from our customers on a frequent basis and figure out what features they want us to build. Because we have a good idea of what's going to be on our roadmap, but we really, really want to hear from our customers what they want to see, and then we're going to prioritize that to build for them. Wow. You know, 3,000 bets from 400 people. <laughs> There's a lot of betting going on out there, isn't there? Mm-hmm. It's early days for the sports betting and fancy sports industry. Yep. Yeah. 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 No, no wonder most of my friends don't have any money. It's like they're they're all sports aficionados and they're always talking about this. And but I mean, if you, sports betting is a little different than like playing the roulette wheel or playing poker, right? I mean you have some knowledge. You have some knowledge. And and, and I, I guess like like what is the most like important thing in sports betting is it just like knowing the teams knowing the players staying on top of it luck i mean i mean one of the most interesting things is that people will watch any game if they have action on it so you know if you're an eagles or giants fan you'll of course watch your team and always support your team but if it's monday night football and you don't care about either of these teams but you have five dollars on whatever team to win like you just bring that much more engagement to every single matchup so it's really knowing the players, who the rosters are, if there's anyone injured on each other side of the team that can kind of affect the betting side. So a bunch of different factors, but I'd say what we've noticed is that by having even a dollar on a matchup, your engagement jumps up so much. Right. Yeah. Do you have a charity aspect to this? Yeah, definitely. So we've partnered with Fight for Children. They're a nonprofit in DC who empowers uh, youth for, with sports. And we've also, when you download the app, and create your account you partner with a charity foundation of your choice so we have two nfl players on there that you know you can make donations and as you place more bets on the platform you automatically trigger like a ten dollar donation to that charity and then as i mentioned with the currency that you have on the platform you can also just send a donation to a company with your in-game credits wow so uh yeah tom did you have any thoughts or questions on the project here I, I love the fact that you're engaging the early users and getting their feedback. I think that's, you know, it's a great best practice and it'll certainly probably give you very different um, uh, features and benefits that you might not have prioritized in your roadmap so early. So I absolutely love that. And I love the idea of actually playing. So I'll be downloading that tonight. <laughs> what about you, Johnny? Are you going to do it? <laughs> Johnny's like all in. I can just tell by the when way, he's, the way right? he's looking. It's a space that uh, I really love and familiar with. We have a company in our portfolio called U Stadium uh, that's for super fans. A uh, little different, but definitely similar and overlapping space there. 
uh, but I head right to the data story here. So the difference between enabling and believe it or not, these micro communities like a kickball community will bet on themselves and will have fancy spreadsheets to do this. Uh, but there's no trusted data source where so he'll can plug right into those known data sources like the NFL and the Major League Baseball feed uh, to make that happen. I am curious how big that other space is actually these, you know, I want an alternative bets. It's sort of like the altcoin of the uh, of the betting world here. Mm -hmm. uh, and there are folks looking at opportunities for that. But uh, I love to hear that you're tracking the right metrics and that you're being cautious with your iterations there. I also think about You've got the 400 on platform. How are you engaging the 40,000 like uh, socially and getting ahead of it so that those floodgates open? Yeah, definitely. So we have a few marketing channels, but one that we're really passionate about is our Discord channel. So we've spun up a Discord channel with people that have downloaded the app, but we also have a launch team. Otherwise, you know, brand ambassadors, 20 awesome people that are scattered throughout the country virtually. And one of them is actually a moderator of the fantasy football football discord chat, which has like 10 to 12,000 people on it. So we have partnerships in place with some of these people that as we scale and grow out, we have these channels that we can flood. And then in addition to that, the typical channels like YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, we'll be utilizing those with AB tests to figure out which one is most effective. For those of you not familiar Discord has eaten a whole category. Uh, you don't build community functionality into your software, or your app anymore. You just stand up a Discord. Uh, it's it's really amazing, the, uh, and the users adapted to it perfectly. Came out of gaming. Yeah, and one one really notable point is that out of our 400 users, you know, at least 50 percent of them have come on via referral. Which, if you think about it, in a fantasy sports league, you might have anywhere from eight to 12 players in the league. If you can convince one person in the league that this app, this platform and this app is worth downloading, there's a good chance that they'll organically tell the rest of the league. So mm -hmm. we feel that, you know, talking to each leagues and figuring out what's really important for them will really help us build that viral engine of growth. Wow. That sounds, sounds great. It sounds like the future is bright for uh, better betting, right? So, <laughs> 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 so that's really great. And so um, what led you to, you know, kind of, do this i mean um i know yeah. that before you started you had a regular job and um and now you're into this so yeah I'm interested in learning a little bit about what motivated you to make the transition yeah so i started off uh, my college career after that at jp morgan chase where you know spent a few years on the engineering side and then moved into product management where i can definitely agree with what tom was saying the entrepreneur side i think is one where it really depends on your organization. If you're working on a product that you're kind of just keeping the lights on day in and day out, not too much innovation going on there. But if you're building something new and launching something new to the market, which I had the opportunity to do at JP Morgan Chase was um, something that I was really proud about. And then worked at American Express for about a year uh, while building up the company and just came to a point where I knew that if I really wanted to take this to the next level, then we'd have to kind of start going full-time on it. So I went full-time on it but I also have a great group of co-founders. So my co-founder, Will, has a great marketing and design hat. Co-founder, Evan, graduated law school. My other friend, Sean, he's investment on the investment banking side. And then we've also built an advisory board that people that have had senior roles at the DraftKings, ESPN, NFL, NBA. And with this team, collectively, we feel like we're in a great spot to kind of grow and, and build the platform. That sounds great. I mean, uh, just a, absolutely uh, uh, a fantastic start. Kenya, did you have a question or a comment? Yeah, well, I mean, this is fascinating. I have a sports marketing background. I used to do a lot of stuff with the Yankees and the Giants. So I, I know that there's a huge, huge opportunity with what you're doing. I'm having an issue like just understanding the odds of it all because I was watching the T Tyson Fury and the Wilder fight over the weekend and I'm like, God, like, are people betting for Tyson? Are they betting for Wilder? So how does someone kind of like navigate that world of like sports betting and just under have a better understanding of it? Yeah, so that's like, that's like uh, what our platform does is it enables you to bet on your own fancy leagues matchups. But what you're mentioning is like, you know, you go to a friend's house with a bunch of people on a Saturday night and you got the UFC fight or the boxing fight that everyone paid for. And it just makes it so much more interesting by putting 
five dollars ten dollars down on who you think is going to win doing a little bit of research like checking out what's their record in the past couple fights or how they've done against you know a right-handed versus left-handed boxer everyone has their own types of stats that they go to but again i'll just go back to the point where putting even a little bit of action on a game just makes things that much more exciting for sure and i'll just let you know the only stat i used for tyson fury winning was we share the same birthday so that was, I was like, no way. <laughs> that's all it takes. That's very scientific, Tanya. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you on the show, uh, Sahil. We wish you the absolute most fantastic success possible. It sounds like uh, sky's the limit. So, so uh, yes, can I ask this... Sahil if he's raising? Yeah. Are yeah, you raising so... right now? Yeah, so we're actually very close to closing out our pre-seed round. The goal is 250000 and then um, the milestones there were to launch the app to the App Store and get to 1,000 users, and we'll be raising our next round in the coming months, uh, which is going to... Sorry, yeah. you're in New York City? I'm in New Jersey. You're in Jersey. Yeah, I'd love to get your deck. Awesome. Yeah, of course. Oh, and this is what we love. We sometimes get these great connections yeah. on the show. So I, I'm going to get awesome. Tom to write a book together. <laughs> yeah, there you go. See, Nobody I, ever asked me for my deck. I love you know? people like you guys because you come on here and you get something out of it. You take something away with you. This is awesome. So um, with that, we have to go to break. Sorry, but anybody that wants to come on the show that's an entrepreneur or an investor or guest level can certainly come on the show and make these connections for themselves. So you're listening to Passage to Profit on WOR 710. We'll be right back. Welcome back, listeners. You are listening to Passage to Profit on WOR 710 with Richard and Elizabeth Gearhart. And we are on to our final presenter now, Antonia Tomeo. And I just love her story and her inspiration and her product. So I'm going to let her explain it in her own words. Welcome. Hi, Elise. Uh, hi, Elizabeth. Hi, Richard. Thank you so much for having me here. Um, I really am excited to be here. And I wanted to just say that I'm really happy to be with this amazing panel um, from Tom to Johnny to Sahil. I loved everything that they were saying and doing. And as Tom was saying earlier, it does take a village. You know, having this support team, um, having the both of you who, you know, have supported me from day one, you know, being my attorneys, but also being this amazing support system, uh, introducing me to the people that I work with today and having sounding boards to just kind of go backward and supporting me and loving what I do is really special. So I have created the Broken Praying Cross with Angel Inspired Bead with God as a symbol of hope and love and to let to remind everyone that they are not alone in their brokenness and um, the story originated three years ago when I found myself broken and alone in church and a woman appeared who I like to call my angel and she gave me a rosary and she said to me do you see Jesus staring at the mural and I said yes and she said Jesus loves you Jesus wants to help you Jesus knows you Jesus is a doctor pray that rosary got me through a really, really hard time in my life. And I wanted to create something for everyone to remind them that they are not alone. And that's what inspired me to create the Broken Praying Cross, because it's universal. We are all broken. And everybody has a story. Although I have my story, everyone has their own. And I have to say that I started with the cross and I started with a trendy modern look and the packaging is a luxury item look. Um, but it seems to be really affecting people and reaching them emotionally because it's a different take. It's, 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 it's the cross, but it's a different take on the cross. It's, it's a universal symbol that everyone can understand and relate to. And um, it, the reviews on it have been great. Um, as I said, I started with the rosary. It taught me how to pray. It got me through my healing. I received, it's a story of healings and miracles. There's a true story behind it. And now we're going to be doing a Indiegogo campaign launching the rosary. So I'm going to take the rosary and we're going to be changing it into and, and putting the symbol of the broken praying cross in the centerpiece and in the cross itself. That's, so we're gonna have a few different looks. That's excellent. So if you could describe the cross a little bit, it's a, it's a wooden cross. With a so I'm actually wearing it. Right, but we're on radio. Right, so <laughs> I'm gonna explain it. Right, 
<laughs> yeah. So it's a it's a little wooden cross on a what what kind of it's not a chain, it's like a rope. So um, it's it's a leather necklace. Okay. And there's two looks. There's a double cord, a 17 inch, and then there's a single cord. And it has all sterling silver parts. It has a pink bead on, by the locket um, to symbolize the rosary as a, as a symbol of what my angel gave me, but also as a symbol of uh, hope. And um, inside the wooden cross, there is a broken figure. And inside the broken figure, there's an actual person bent over in prayer. So it's really beautiful, but it's not, um, I don't know how to say this politely. It's, Over the top. Right. It's right. Yeah. It's something you it's could actually modern. wear right. and it's not huge. Yes. And it's stuff. very right. trendy looking too. Yeah, it is. Which is what the younger generation is loving about it. Right. So where are you selling this and how many are you selling right now? So um, I'm on platforms such as my website. I'm on Amazon. I am on Etsy. I'm in a couple of boutique stores. Um, and I've actually, a couple of charities have even reached out to me that I've donated the cross to. Um, so I'm working with them as well and it's doing very well. Um, so it's, you know, doing very well. And I've also started back to what Johnny was saying and what Tom was saying. Um, I started a prayer group on Friday nights. So we st I've gotten people to come on and whether they're speaking or not, or they're listening and the words getting out and everybody is com coming together for prayer. And it's, you know, just a, a nice message of hope. And uh, yeah. So Kenya, did you have a question or comment? Well, I just had a comment because I was having a pretty rough day, I would say three or four months ago. And you know, I got a little package in the mail that I kind of had sat to the side and didn't pay attention to. And then just said, you know, I'm opening up this thing. And it was actually a cross that Antonia had sent me. So on the day where I kind of needed some faith and I needed some inspiration, it came. And I always feel that um, God is so timely when he knows what you need. And I think in a time where we're go all going through a lot of different things, there's a lot of changes in the world. I think this people are curious about faith. They're curious about something yes. that is bigger than them. So I just wanted to say thank you for sending that because it showed up on time and really encouraged me that day. So thank you. No, I thank you. And that's what it's doing. I mean, I can't tell you how many people call me and say, someone bought me a present and it, it was your cross and it's done. So, and they take off the cross they're wearing because they feel so connected to what has been given to them. So what you're saying has been happening to a lot of different people. And it makes me so proud because I'm so passionate about it and it makes me feel good. So thank you for that testimony. It, it really makes the world of a difference for me. I appreciate it. So, Antonio, without going into too much detail, tell us a little about, about the difficult times that you were confronting that. Uh, um, I think that everyone goes through a really hard time at times. And I was dealing with depression. I was dealing with anxiety. But I was dealing with an underlying health condition. And I chucked it up to being a mom. And I didn't realize it was causing all of these other issues. So that's what led me to church that day. Um, and it was through prayer that I received the miracles of healings. Um, well, and it's really cool that you made a product out of it because you're really passing it along in a physical way that people can identify with. But I know getting that product during COVID was a huge challenge. So can you tell us a little bit about your supply chain troubles and how you overcame them? Faith. <laughs> 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 but, um, you know, it, it, it's really interesting. Um, I, I didn't, I really just gave it all to God and there was a lot of problems getting the product through COVID, but God is bigger than anything else. And it arrived on a miraculous day and it arrived when it was supposed to arrive. Um, I really, I have to say it was trials and tribulations and a lot of ups and downs, just like being an entrepreneur is, right? A lot of roller coaster rides, but I kept the faith through it all. And um, the team that I work with made sure that it arrived when it arrived. Um, and, and it was perfect time. It was divine timing for sure. Right. And you're working with Lisa Askelis, who's yes, been on the show a number she of is times. Phenomenal. And I'm working with her team as well. 
um, that she's introduced me to. So Johnny, any thoughts or comments? Uh, I, I think it's great. Uh, I love how you've taken your own challenges and turned them into a source of strength for yourself and others. Uh, I'm actually a little interested in the design process. I was looking at the website and seeing the design and thinking a little bit of the contrary to what Tom and I are saying, right? Sometimes you do need to take that leap uh, of faith, but at the same time, when you, you know, I hear a lot of serendipity in what you're talking about. And we look at timing a lot uh, when we choose uh, what, what companies to invest in and partner with. Um, and to me, serendipity is opening yourself up to the right timing. Uh, and I, I see a lot of that in the prayer that you've used to make a lot of great things happen. So that's awesome. Excellent. Uh, yeah, that's excellent. Tom, do you have any, uh, any thoughts or? Um... Yeah, so I, I think it's a, a really nice project. I had a quick look at the website as well uh, before we came on air. I think one of the things that, um, you know, from a pure innovation perspective, you know, one of the things I'll often challenge people with is how is it different or better? And I think what you've created has that objective to be different and that objective to be better in a certain way. Um, and you've got a specific, unique angle. So um, I think those are things that are typically good success factors when you're creating new products or services. Wow, so there that's you go. a great vote of confidence. That's a great Antonio. vote of confidence. So, yeah. So, so uh, where can where can people find your uh, find you and your your product? Uh, they can go to my website at antoniaspromise.com. I'm on also Amazon, Etsy, and um, a couple of boutique stores. They can follow me on Instagram, and I have a really great site there. Perfect. Well, thank you so much for joining us. It's good to see you again, Antonia. As always. Uh, and uh, we'll be back right after this message with more Passage to Profit. What an astounding show we had this week. It was so awesome. I enjoyed well, I, everything and I, and I learned so much. Yeah. And especially Antonio's uh, comments at the end really inspired me. Well, so. And I do have to say that this show had quite the variety of people and projects, but we did do, we have done some consumer testing for people listening to the show and they like that they like that <laughs> you never know what's going to happen you never know what you're going to get right so so, so we there started, are people like that by the way we started with tom pullen with Inno, innovinco innovinco and he teaches people in large corporate settings or corporations to how to be innovative how to innovate within the corporate structure and lots of great tips on how to, you can be innovative as an entrepreneur yes and so you can find his website at innovinco.com and you can find him on linkedin i think the name is even uh innovative innovinco which i i think he has trademarks on so he told us that good for you, good for yeah. you. <laughs> and he has a youtube channel youtube.com slash innovinco so if you can't find tom it's your own fault <laughs> 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 then we had johnny lahane um he's with the hudson valley startup fund but not, not a rock star not a guitar player we all thought johnny lahane was a rock star but he is in a different way. A rock star in the business world. A rock star in the business he world. He did have a very innovative project that he developed and that he became an investor. And but he eventually just kicked it down the road. And so, <laughs> <laughs> so he, you can find him at hvstartupfund.com. So he's in the Hudson Valley uh, and he's in a really interesting space where, lend, well, investment money is concerned because he's kind of in an in-between space. So he's definitely worth talking to if you I, haven't. Yeah, absolutely. And he's into innovation and has starting all these things. So taking his creativity to the max for sure. Right. And then Kenya Gibson from iHeart, Gibson with a P, Kenya Gibson at iHeartMedia.com. She did our power move and she's also a huge help for this show. She's, she tells us what to say. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy, I'm sorry, Kenya. 
<laughs> they have then, very strict then, rules then, at iHeart. And then know, he says something completely back. different. Right? <laughs> but anyway, um, so Kenya is here for all your radio needs and in digital marketing. And She's digital marketing us a lot. and all podcasting, the whole ball of wax. iHeart is the number one podcaster network now. And we have used uh, uh, iHeart for our, our digital uh, marketing services forever. And they've gotten us great results. So if you would like similar results, make <laughs> okay. sure okay. that you contact Kenya. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> we, had, we, we had Sahil Patel with Better Fantasy, B-E-T-T-O-R, fantasy.com. So if you want to get your friends together and bet on sports games, this is the way to do it now. This is a new way to do it. So, so can you accept like mortgage deeds or titles <laughs> to a, <laughs> the website? For you, Richard, I have yes. some really, I have some really sh- hot tips that I'm going to make sure I, I capitalize on. Okay. <laughs> good to know. Anyway, and then Antonia Tomeo, A-N-T-O-N-I-S, Antonia's promise.com and she has this great cross on a leather rope that is that helps bring us all together makes us realize nobody's perfect and she has a rosary now too so you can find them things on her website yeah very inspirational i should visit her website and you'll you'll feel inspired so absolutely absolutely so if you haven't heard all of the show, then or you want to hear it again, you need to go to our podcast, uh, which will be available tomorrow, and you can get it on Apple, Pandora, wherever podcasts, iHeart, I Heart, <laughs> wherever your podcasts are available. So make sure you pick it up and send it off to a friend or uh, uh, okay. what have you. Now on to Tom for final comments. Yeah, sure. Tom, what are your final comments? <laughs> Um, firstly, it's been a real pleasure to be on here. So a British guy from Paris speaking to New York. It's a, it's a very pleasant uh, experience. That's a very uh, but cosmopolitan what... <laughs> uh, lifestyle there. I, I think if there's one kind of observation is that everything to do with innovation and entrepreneurship, at the end of the day, it all comes down to people. And uh, as you've seen tonight, it's about people talking to people. It's about people meeting people. It's uh, in the case of Johnny, it's about people helping and financing people. So I think, you know, that's really my message. We should focus on people if we want to make innovation and profits and entrepreneurship happen. Absolutely. Absolutely. And Johnny, what are your parting thoughts? Well, I was going to say my big word coming out of this is action also uh, was talked about throughout uh, some of the conversations. And maybe now more than ever, let's put the people and the actions together. Uh, and when you can safely be face to face with folks, um, it will, uh, it will shake the dust off. Uh, a lot of us have been, you know, kind of hankering down for a while. So get into action. Um, I love that idea that innovation, the big difference is the action. Uh, yeah. Lots of folks have great ideas, but uh, put them through the ringer. Smash yeah. into the market. Sounds good. Kenya? I'm actually going to use Johnny's word, serendipitous. Did I say that right? You did. Yes. Right. So I think. You know, I, there, I think this conversation was very serendipitous, right, in nature. And we got to talk about all things, right? Investment wise, innovation wise, faith wise, and beating the odds, literally. So there you go. Very, very well rounded conversation. So I was happy to be a part of it. Well, thank you, Kenya. Always a pleasure to have you with us for sure. Yeah. So I guess that's about it, isn't it? It's time to sign off. Thanks everyone for listening. We'll and be back. Thank to- you to our producer. And thank you to our producer. I was going to say thank you for listening. And don't forget, we'll be back next week with another outstanding Passage to Profit show. Then I was going to say we'd like to thank all of the people that make this possible. Our producer, Noah Fleischman, our program coordinator, Alicia Morrissey, and our video editor, Chatterboss. You're listening to Passage to Profit on WOR 710, the voice of New York. And that's a wrap.